Hey, love bugs and love bugs to be and my readers. How about chapter five before we get the day started? Chapter five, a world within a world. It felt like as soon as I closed my eyes, the lights came on and they were super bright. The noise was back on too, on high volume and everybody was up scrambling around. I asked Melissa what was happening, and she said people were getting ready to go to their jobs. Most of the women in that pod worked in the kitchen on different shifts. I heard them call my name over the PA system, and Melissa told me to go with her and ask to work in the kitchen so I could have access to extra food. As far as I was concerned, Melissa was my best friend, and I would have done anything she told me to do at that time. In some way, I wonder what would have happened had I asked to work as a porter or something. I followed Melissa downstairs to a desk where an officer was sitting, passing out job assignments. There was a long line of women and I was in line behind Melissa. When I approached the officer, I told him my name and he said, where are your boots? Boots? I don't have any. I had never been issued any boots. He said, you can't work without boots. Go upstairs and get some. Uh, I can't just go take somebody's boots. Those girls already don't like me. Every here, everything here belongs to the county. So just go upstairs and grab some boots so you can work. I said, all right, I tried to tell you. So I stepped out of line to go back upstairs to get some boots. I think Melissa was standing there waiting for me. I ran upstairs to get some boots, but I couldn't find any that were my size. I looked over past the bed and I saw a pair of boots that looked like they might fit me. As I walked over to get them and check the size, I felt someone come out of nowhere and push me hard. It was some lady that just came from nowhere. Now that I think about it, she must have been laying on her bed watching me. She probably saw me walk from fighting those two girls the night before and thought I was a punk or something. I later learned that her name was Tammy Razor. At first, I thought that she pushed me by accident, so I said, my bad, I'm just trying to get over here and get those boots. I tried to walk around her, but she pushed me again, harder. I had never been pushed, especially not like that. I giggled a little because I didn't understand why she was pushing me. I said, stop pushing me. She raised her right hand and said, you don't know who you're fucking with. I saw that she was holding an orange razor. Before she could push me a third time, I picked her up, flipped her upside down, and body slammed her onto the concrete floor. I got on top of her and started wailing on her face nonstop, left, right, left, right, nonstop. I had blacked out. I had no realization of what was happening. I heard no sound at all. Even though by this time, the alarms were going off, and the girls that were there were on their beds, shouting, fighting words of encouragement. I heard nothing at all. All I could hear was the voice in my head. Why isn't she fighting back? My hands feel like feathers. I'm not even hurting her. I must have counted 10 straight socks to her face. Then, out of my peripheral vision, I saw blood drops and I thought, Where's that blood coming from? She's not even hitting me back. All this time, I heard no other sound, nothing at all. And I saw nothing at all. I didn't even see the deputies coming up the stairs and there were a lot of them. They pulled me off of her and dragged me to the other side of the room. I can't even remember if my eyes were open or closed when I was hitting her because I was in such a deep, trance. This has never ever happened to me before and it's scary to know that I carry this hidden fighting talent and silent rage. I felt like I had superpower, incredible strength. I would later realize that I had a problem with blackouts, but I never got any help for it. I didn't know where to go to get help for it. Suddenly, I heard sound again and snapped back to reality. There was an extreme amount of noise going on. The girls were shouting and the alarms were going off like crazy. They were flashing red and blue lights like police sirens going off. 
the deputy took me to the other side of the room and handcuffed me. I started shouting at me. I told you this would happen. I told you this would happen. I was crying and I looked toward the stairs and there were so many officers running up the stairs. It was crazy, crazy, crazy. And I knew I was in trouble, trouble, trouble. Especially when I saw them carry Tammy off on a stretcher. I had been in jail for less than 24 hours and already I was in deep, deep trouble. I didn't realize how much serious trouble I was going to be in. What kind of life is this that I'm living now? How did I get here? I mean, when will this madness end? I later learned that the medical staff had to take Tammy to a real hospital, one outside of the jail because the jail hospital didn't have the right equipment to help her in there. She was in pretty bad condition. I really hurt her, but she really asked for it. I mean, she begged for it, didn't she? When I got to the bottom of the staircase, the first face I saw looking at me was Melissa. She looked sad for me. I wondered what she was thinking. I wondered if she saw the fight. I paused for a second and looked at her and just shook my head as I was led away by the officer. That would be the last time I saw Melissa for a while. I had no idea what to expect next. My life was in the hands of the jail staff. I'm sure the girls who wanted to fight me the night before saw the fight and were glad that I didn't beat them up that way. I honestly never knew that side of me existed. I don't know how I was able to pick that lady up and flip her upside down like that. Whatever came over me or whatever took over me ain't no kind of joke. I felt no anger or evil energy at all. The whole time I was beating her up, I felt peaceful inside. So maybe it was my guardian angel protecting me. There was no rage or anger. As a matter of fact, when Tammy pushed me the first time, I giggled, so I wasn't mad or anything. I was excited to see what working in the kitchen with Melissa was going to be like. I guess I had built up anger that I didn't know about. Or maybe it was built up frustration from all my pain and injustice. I can't even begin to explain or understand why my hearing was muted. I was taken into a room that looked like a little visiting room. There were glass windows and lots of metal stools. I was handcuffed by my ankle to one of the metal stools with my wrist still handcuffed behind my back. I was left sitting there for what seemed like hours. I was super agitated. When I would see an officer walk by, I would start shouting at him. They kept ignoring me until I started shouting for a watch commander. I shouted and shouted and shouted at the top of my lungs and would not stop until someone finally came. I'm sure everybody in the whole entire jail could hear me screaming. I felt like I was losing my mind. When the watch commander finally came, I tried to explain the whole situation, but he didn't want to hear it. He had already read my initial arrest report and saw the judge's comments and thought I was a monster, too. This situation was basically out of his hands, especially since there had been a medical emergency attached to it. This kind of emergency had never happened in county jail before, not even on the men's side. They were still trying to figure out what to do with me. He was done with me. I felt like I was in a nightmare and I couldn't wake up. I was pretty much on my own and being innocent didn't mean anything. The way he saw it, I was the predator and Tammy was my victim that I almost killed. I thank God that I didn't kill her. He basically left without even listening to a word I said. And honestly, I was so out of it, I had no concept of what was really happening. It was like I was sleepwalking, but wide awake, if that makes sense. I was basically a walking zombie, and that condition has to have some legality to it. Fighting and screaming had exhausted me, and I fell asleep. I'm sure everybody in the whole jail was happy that I had stopped screaming. I was wakened by an officer who came to take me to my next destination. 
I didn't even care where I was going as long as I could rest. I was starting to get used to being led around. It was an adventure into the unknown as far as I saw it. This time I was led to the bottom of the jail to what felt like a dungeon. And it was a dungeon. It was C211, a place for the worst of the worst. The worst of the worst? Really? All of this over a squirrel, $25, and a cell phone? Really? After what seemed the longest, slowest walk ever, we entered an elevator and went down. When the elevator door opened, there was a very long, dimly lit hallway that looked like it was a mile long. There were red doors on each side of the hallway. As I walked past each room, I saw an information sign with the inmate's last name and a fence on it. Each information sign read something different. Contraband, insubordinate, fighting, homosecting, etc. There was a small window in the center of each door. In the lower part of the door was a slot about a foot long and six inches wide for food trays to slide through. The creepiest thing about that walk was seeing the faces and eyes looking at me from the small windows as I walked past. They were saying things like, what you looking at? Or who you, what you do? I thought to myself, they must be crazy and this must be jail hell. Those women must be really bad. It was cold, stale, and dreary down there. If this didn't earn me jail points, nothing would. I was starting to feel like I was starring in a scary movie. It's a good movie. It's an exciting, unpredictable movie. But I'm ready for this movie to end. Director, please call. Cut. There I was in the bottom of a dungeon and no one knew where I was. I felt like nobody cared where I was. My life was very sad and things were about to get worse. My life was no longer of any value as far as I was concerned. Be very careful of what you ask for in this life because you just might get it. I didn't ask God to send me to jail per se, but I did ask God to send me another world. I guess things were leading up to this because I didn't want I because I did want to see what the inside of jail was like and getting arrested was really the only way to know. Or I could have gotten a job as a correction officer. I never planned on ever being inside of 211 though. I had been to so many different parts of that jail. I was basically cell hopping, but I had seen enough. This whole experience was more than enough for me. I never, ever wanted to go back to that place. Never, ever. And so ends the reading for chapter five. And I'll see you later. Ciao.